to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. At the base of Mount Molas in the Valley of Hermes lies the ancient city of Sardis, which was 60 miles from the coast. Its location was the great crossroads of the trade route to the region, and Sardis was the capital city of the Lydian Empire. With its watered valleys and its pomegranate trees, Lydia is a beautiful place. The first location we come to is the entrance of the complex. It is here that we see the mall where the shops and businesses service the people. We can still see the remains of the restrooms that were in the strip mall. It doesn't look like there was much privacy in this restroom. What's so neat about being in this place is that we're, we're standing where early Sabbath believing Christians kept the Sabbath every week right here and they worship God and they study the Bible and it's just so wonderful to be here and to experience this and that was probably a pure experience for them back then so I'm just blessed we're all blessed to be here unfortunately when the Jewish nation rejected Christ they took on the appendages of pagan worship in their synagogues as we will see After leaving the mall, we come to the largest excavated Jewish synagogue. Out in the courtyard, we still see the laver that stands here where ceremonial washing took place. When you look at the mosaic floors, we see a Jewish and Greek influence. It was sad to see the mixing of Jewish and pagan rites all in one place. If you look closely, you can see the yin and yang, where God is depicted of being bad and good. Here we can see the ancient pagan symbol of the swastika, which is a symbol of the movement of the sun. Now on the side of the gymnasium, we come through one of the two arches that leads to the open gymnasium that was used for exercise. Well, we are here now in Sardis, and we are looking at the gym where exercise was done in the open air. With its delicate Greek columns that make up the post and lintel construction, it must have been a beautiful place to exercise in. Looking toward the gym, we can see the pillars that allow fresh air to come into the complex. After leaving the gym, we come to the waiting pools and the bathhouses where hundreds of people would bathe after working out.
It's interesting that the Greek historian Herodotus tells us that Sardis was the first to strike and mint coins around the 7th century. About two kilometers from Sardis' town center is the Temple of Artemis. Okay, now we're in Sardis, but we're in the pagan side. This is the Temple of Artemis. Pillars are quite magnificent. It's just a beautiful place here. As we walk along the side of the temple, we can see the foundation is made out of solid granite, etched with beautiful artistry. This temple of Artemis is one of the largest of the seven Greek temples, even two times larger than the Roman pantheon. As these pillars point to the sky, we can see that they are of fabulous size and these pillars are of Corinthian design. To get an idea how big these pillars are, uh, I had Shabbat stand next to it. it. These things are just enormous. Here we see a relief that's dedicated to the uh, priestess of Artemis. And as we see here, it says priestess of Artemis. Um, back in those days, only the pagan religions had women in charge of the church. Today, we see this, this kind of belief entering into the Christian church where we have women's ordination. This is not the will of God to go this direction. Behind this mountain, was a fort that had a reputation of being impregnable by enemies. But Sardis was captured two times in its history by the Greeks and Romans. Both times this impregnable fort was taken over because the guards were not watching or they fell asleep at their post. So when Christ gave his warning to the church of Sardis, they knew plainly of their danger by their history. After the close of the Dark Ages that lasted from 538 to 1798, when Napoleon's general Berthier broke the papal arms, the church entered into a new phase. With the advent of the American and British Bible societies and the freedom of the printed word into many countries, Satan was on the ground to weaken the Protestant name. Yes, they had the name Protestant in their past history, but when their great leaders had died, they lost their momentum to know further truth and like Sardis, fell asleep at their post. So the great Protestant churches became nominal, that is to say, a church that lost its meaning and focus. Through the popularity of church creeds, men did not study the word of God for further light of truth, but sunk down into a state of conformity to the doctrines of men. It's interesting that John Robinson warned the Pilgrim Fathers that the Bible had more light to shine from its pages. In the historical time period of Sardis, the church was to start the call of the Lord's second advent to this earth. Christ warns them that they need to watch for signs of his coming, or he would come as a thief. Today, many are falling asleep, thinking that they will have a second chance after a few are secretly raptured into heaven, but the Bible does not give witness to this theory. The idea of a secret rapture is totally unbiblical, and the thought that people are going to be raptured out of their clothes and taken into heaven secretly, you can't find this anywhere in scripture. The truth of the matter is that there were two Jesuit doctors that had opposing views. One was a preterist and one was a futurist. And these two fought against each other 
and presented their messages to the Protestant church. And then the Protestant church started to fight among themselves. This was a plan from the Jesuits to get the Protestant church to stop looking at the papacy and start looking at either another event far off into the future or some event far off in the past. These two Jesuits took Daniel 9 verse 27, which refers to Christ's ministry and the work of the Holy Spirit through the apostles, and applied it to two different events which the early Protestants would never have recognized. Now let us look at the historical facts from Protestant and Catholic writers. Accordingly, toward the close of the century of the Reformation, two of her, the Church of Rome, most learned doctors set themselves to the task, each endeavoring by different means to accomplish the same end, namely that of diverting men's minds from perceiving the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Antichrist in the papal system. The Jesuit Alcazar devoted himself bringing into prominence preterist method of interpretation, that the prophecies of Antichrist were fulfilled before the popes ever ruled at Rome, and therefore could not apply to the papacy. On the other hand, the Jesuit Ribera tried to set aside the application of these prophecies to the papal power by bringing out the futurist system, which asserts that these prophecies refer properly not to the career of the papacy, but to that of some future supernatural individual who is yet to appear and to continue in power for three and a half years. Thus, as Alfred says, the Jesuit Rivera, about A.D. 1580, may be regarded as the founder of the futurist system in modern time. Roman Catholics, as well as Protestants, agree as to the origin of these interpretations. He says the futuristic school, founded by the Jesuit Rivera in 1591, looks for Antichrist, Babylon, and a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem at the end of the Christian dispensation. The Praetorist school founded by the Jesuit Alcazar in 1614 explains the revelation by the fall of Jerusalem or by the fall of pagan Rome in 410 AD. Similarly, Dean Henry Alford, Protestant, declares, the founder of the system, Futurist, in modern times appears to have been the Jesuit Ribera about A.D. 1580. The Preterist view found no favor and was hardly so much as thought of in the times of primitive Christianity. The view is said to have been first promulgated in anything like completeness by the Jesuit Alcazar in 1614. The former Catholic John Nelson Darby of the 17th century promoted the Futurist view of the Jesuits, and that view was put in the Schofield Study Bible Notes, and then it was popularized by Tim LaHaye and Jerry B. Jenkins in the Left Behind series. It's interesting to note that even Charles Spurgeon was concerned about Darby's unbiblical views. The fact of the matter is that 1 Thessalonians 5, 2-9 and 2 Peter 3, 10-12 says that Christ's return will be an audible and visible second coming. In other words, the timing of Christ's coming is a secret, not the event. The Bible says no man knows the day or the hour. And also when Christ comes, there will not be a second chance. When Hebrews 3 verse 15 says, Today do not harden your heart as they did in the rebellion. We have to remember that God took Noah through the flood, not from it. And also, that God took the three Hebrews through the fire and not from it. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11 it says this, Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So all the stories in the Bible our ensamples are examples of what will happen at the end of time. The white raiment is a symbol of the purity of truth. In Revelation 19 verse 8 it says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, 
clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Matthew 22, 1-14 is the parable where Jesus told those who are invited to the wedding of the king that the guests had to have on the wedding garment that was supplied by the king himself. In the parable, the king was a symbol of God the Father, and the wedding was a symbol of his son marrying the new Jerusalem, and the garment symbolized Christ's righteousness. And the guests had to have on Christ's robe of righteousness to enter into heaven and to eat the supper of the Lamb. And so it was, during the period of Sardis, there were still men and women that would eventually proclaim the second advent of Christ during the Philadelphia church time period. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches.